So thanks everybody for being here so much. Um, my name is Jessica Gowers. Thank you um, for attending another one of these sessions. We had 77, 78 people register for the session today. So just like last time, I'm so ecstatic to see that turnout. We've worked with Goodwill Industries before. They're a really great partner of ours. Bev is the Executive Director and Vice President of Mission Advancement for Goodwill Industries Career Center, Ontario Great Lakes. And she has 20, over 20 years experience working at the London Health Science Center in the Inpatient Adolescent Mental Health and Psychiatric Division. So thank you so much, Bev, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you to get started. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, yeah, I just, I wanna first say uh, that I'm really appreciating that Jessica brought this topic forward. I know that it resonates with a lot of us on this call. <laughs> um, and we know that um, the impacts of mental health prior to COVID were absolutely something that was becoming um, an area that employers were starting to pay attention to. And obviously since uh, 2020, um, there's been an increase. So we're gonna chat a little bit about all of this today, but yes, thanks Jessica for the topic. I think that um, it, it is very welcome. Uh, so today we're going to look at mental health in the workplace and specifically some recent Canadian statistics and also signs and symptoms if uh, a worker is potentially experiencing mental health challenges in your workplace. The business case for accommodating workers with mental health challenges, strategies to ensure a psychologically healthy workplace, and then resources that I hope you'll find helpful um, and uh, you may or may not be aware of some of them. And before I go on, I just want to share that, you know, Goodwill Industries, we have an employee base of 1,200 people, and we intentionally recruit um, from the more barriered uh, job seekers. So we, you know, have partnerships across Southwestern Ontario with service providers. So our work, this is very relevant to our work platform. We, and I don't think that we're unique in that, but we definitely um, have a more barriered workforce, generally speaking, across our, our company. So I'm gonna share some of the strategies that we've incorporated um, that you may wanna consider uh, for your own business. So some local uh, recent stats, 47% um, of Canadian workers claim that their workplace brings significant stress. 11% have thoughts and feelings of suicide at work, and 73% of those with mental health issues said that it is affecting their work. And that might be um, their ability to actually attend work regularly. It may impact their productivity levels when they're at work and their interactions and relationships with their colleagues. One in five Canadians experience a mental health problem or mental illness every year. 30% of disability claims are related to mental health issues and $50 billion per year is the cost of mental health problems um, and mental illness in Canada. And these stats were in 2019, early 2020, before the pandemic. So we know that these statistics may look a little different as we go forward. So why are businesses, employers, looking to address mental health in our workplace? Why do we need to pay attention to this and respond to this? And um, the reality is that if you don't respond or you don't support the health and well-being of your employees, it can be quite costly. And we'll look at this um, when we look at the business case. But in 2018, there was a catalyst uh, research project that um, confirmed that accommodating workers with mental illness really does make sense. There's a cost savings to that and that employers could potentially have see savings of over $200,000 over a five year period. And, and a lot of that is around more um, regular attendance, people are more productive and you have less turnover, which we all know can be very costly to a business. So when we look at the business case, you know, for supporting mental health in your workplace for addressing the mental health and wellness needs of your workforce. There's um, research uh, just shows over and over again that when workers feel supported, uh, they tend to have less absenteeism. If the workplace is a safe place, if they know that they're supported there and they're accommodated, they're more likely to attend. Um, and as a result, you have less turnover. People stay with a company where they again feel supported um, and, and are listened to. 
increased employee engagement. So even for your workers that don't necessarily have mental health challenges, they tend to be more engaged because they see everybody coming into the workplace supported, uh, feeling good, and working together. So you just generally have um, better engagement. Increased job satisfaction. Again, people want to come to work. It's a good place to be, and they like their work because, again, they're feeling supported. It also has an impact on your ability to recruit talent. So again, in your recruitment efforts, you'll be messaging um, your commitment to your employees, um, to their health and wellness. You might um, highlight your benefits package as part of your recruitment. And if your employees are highly engaged, they're talking to their families and friends and their community members about this great place to work. And so it's just, it really helps strengthen your ability to attract talent and then to retain that talent because people come into the workplace and again, they see this labor force that is highly engaged, feeling supported, being productive. And that's your increased return on investment. If people are more engaged, if they're uh, more productive, you're going to, that's going to impact your bottom line. I'll just touch a little bit on some ideas around mental health accommodations because I think there's this perception that, um, well, first, a lot of employers don't know how to even, like, what do I do? How do I support this person that is struggling? And then there's this perception that it's, it's difficult, like it's difficult to accommodate somebody. And um, the reality is that it, it can be very simple things, changes made, um, that can have a significant impact and really little little cost or no cost. So a flexible schedule, and again, not all of these are gonna work in every workplace, but it's just to give you some ideas of things that you might consider. So a flexible schedule, um, this could be just letting somebody start later in the day and working later, or starting earlier in the day and finishing. Um, so an example would be if somebody has depression and they are on medication and mornings are very difficult for them, you know, maybe in start of, instead of starting at seven or eight, maybe they start at 10 or 11 and they work a little later. Um, we have an employee who actually has a daughter who has uh, been diagnosed with anxiety disorder. And this uh, employee just really needed to get their daughter on the bus for school every morning and then come into work. So they, they, they're able to start their day um, an hour later. That's just an, an example of um, kind of a flexible schedule. Modified break schedule, you know, if you tend to have two 15 minute breaks in a half hour lunch throughout the day, some people with mental health would benefit from more frequent, shorter breaks throughout the day. So that's something that you might consider. Job restructuring is a, it's a reasonable accommodation um, where you can take the duties of a job role and either change when those tasks are done or how they're done. Or you might even reallocate or remove some of those more marginal duties from a job just so that it's not so overwhelming for somebody. Um, creating a safe space where somebody can go just to, if they need to step away from their work for a few minutes. So if somebody has panic attacks, for example, or they have anxiety or they feel overwhelmed throughout the day, just knowing that there is a quiet space, they can step away for a few minutes, whether they do their deep breathing or they just, you know, recenter themselves so that they can get back to work. That's very reassuring for people if you're able to provide that. Mentorship is very powerful and we um, will take more senior staff or more tenured staff and as we're onboarding new people, we will kind of connect them to that natural support in the work platform so that they know they have someone to go to if they are struggling, um, they're, they're, kind of, they're not alone. Job coaches are another um, example if that's something that you have um, access to. And modified workstations, so an example would be um, if somebody tends to be very sensitive to uh, noise, that you could get noise canceling headphones, if lights, fluorescent lights bother them, um, you know, changing the lighting, letting them bring in a lamp that has a softer uh, uh, light, um, putting up barriers around their workstation if they're distracted by the activity and the busyness in the workplace is another example. And then remote work. Now, I know this has come up a lot throughout COVID and not every business can offer this, 
but if you can, it is an option um, to just, again, more flexibility, as long as somebody is productive working from home. And I think that's the, the other key thing is that when you're thinking about accommodations, accommodations have to be within a reasonable um, framework. They are not to create undue hardship for an employer. And you can, you know, these options are great. And, and for the most part, they don't create undue hardship. Remote work would need to work for the business and you'd have to have things in place so that you are able to measure somebody's productivity. Um, so those are just a few examples of potential accommodations in the workplace. So why are we striving to have a psychologically healthy workplace? Um, we've talked a bit now about the business case. What are the things that employers could consider doing? And first and foremost is having a really good wellness strategy. And you can do that in partnership with a local company such as um, Employee Wellness Solutions would be one example. Or you can create your own strategy because there are so many great resources on online now um, that you can do that and I'll, I'll share some of those resources but having a strategy that not only looks at the physical health of your um, workforce but also their mental health that overall kind of healthy well-being is really important and then you really need to train your managers and your leaders give them the skills that they know how to first of all recognize the signs so that if somebody is um, suddenly you know coming in late for work they're not automatically assuming that, oh, this person's lazy or they're not motivated, they don't like the job. It could be that they have a mental health concern going on. So really being able to recognize the signs is important and then also training them on how to respond. And so what we've done is we've created critical paths for our managers so that if there's an employee that's in the washroom having a panic attack, that manager has a critical path that walks them through how to respond. If you have an employee who's saying that they think about suicide, there's a critical path. You know, is that person, do they have a plan? Are they actively, um, actively going to act on it? Are they at risk? Because then you're going to call 911. Or is it something that they think about, they don't have a plan, and then there's another, another critical path just to make sure that that person is connected to the supports that they need. Um, so that's been very helpful to our managers, but you do really need to kind of equip them with, with the knowledge on how to respond and feel good about it. And then the training around how to even have those conversations. So if you notice somebody coming into work that, um, let's say, um, all of a sudden they're very withdrawn. So they used to interact with their colleagues. Now they come in, they just kind of quietly do their thing. How does that manager approach that person and start the conversation? Um, so training them on how to listen, how to be empathetic is really important. And um, some of the... Um, signs and symptoms, you know, I, I didn't get into that too much, but you may have an employee who um, is suddenly, I said, being late for work, but also, you know, they're suddenly just missing work, um, where before their attendance had been good. Hygiene is another um, indicator of a mental illness. So if somebody's suddenly coming into work and they're looking unkempt, or they've got body odor, which was never an issue before, that can be a very um, clear indicator of mental illness. Um, if somebody has suddenly have a change in mood, so they are, maybe they have angry outbursts at work, they start yelling at people, um, or they start crying, those types of things, um, again, indicators that something's going on. And so you wanna have people in your workforce that know how to approach that person and have that conversation. Mental health first aid is a great certification and uh, that comes from the Mental Health Commission of Canada that you can uh, have done in your region. Um, I think they're doing it online and the in-person will resume again. It used to be two full days. It's an excellent, uh, it really gives uh, people that confidence in recognizing the signs and kind of knowing what, how to respond. And then you may or may not be familiar with the National Psychological um, Health and Safety Standard. So that's a voluntary standard that came into play in 2013. And I really encourage uh, businesses to be familiar with that standard. There's 13 psychosocial factors within it. A lot of the things we're talking about today, you know, um, things you can do to engage your workforce and have this culture of caring and really um, concern uh, and support for their health and wellness. And you can download that standard online, that's all available. 
Something else that's really important is to have policies that also support the health of your workforce. So you want to have your mission and your values very clearly stated. And in your recruitment practices, processes, you want to clearly highlight the things that you as an employer do for your workforce. And that's around, you know, attracting talent. And then when you're onboarding people that you're talking to them about the things that are available to them. An EAP program is a great example of um, the types of things that you want to be highlighting to new prospective talent and then as you're onboarding people. A comprehensive accommodation policy is really important and having um, you know support from your human resources to kind of help when when somebody does need an accommodation. Documenting um, and communicating is really important and a return to work policy is quite important too. You want to be able to really have a, a policy that informs how do you welcome people back? So after they've been off on a mental health or stress leave, how are you actually welcoming them back so that it's a, a smooth transition for them? Because it's, it's very awkward and it takes a lot of courage for someone to come back to work after a mental health leave. And then metrics, you want to measure the impact of your wellness initiatives. And the, the one thing that I really, really encourage is at minimum an annual employee survey. And it doesn't have to be lengthy or in depth, but that you're asking some questions and checking in with your workforce about the things that you are doing. Are, you know, are they finding it beneficial? What are things that they would need to feel supported? Um, we, we do that every year and we measure year over year the changes and um, you can get a satisfaction rating out of that survey as well. So that would be one great example of how to measure the impact of the good things that you are doing as an employer. And so some of the tips um, for having you know, a mentally, mentally healthy workplace Acknowledgement and recognition. Employees really want to be, they want to feel like they're valued. They want to know that the work they're doing is appreciated. So anything you can do to recognize, and I know some businesses have an employee of the month, uh, might do occasional pizza lunches to celebrate the efforts of the team. Those types of things do go a long way. Um, professional development, access to any type of training, again, where somebody knows that you as an employer are invested in their growth and development any types of opportunities where you can engage your employees at all levels you know especially like the employees on the front line and that may be through town halls that the president or ceo or executive director may hold um, it may be small little team meetings where on the agenda there's opportunity for people to have a voice and share some feedback share some ideas uh, the employee surveys I mentioned, mental health first aid training, having community partners, community presentations is a great idea because it's usually um, often they'll do it for free or it's quite a low cost. You know, um, CMHA is a great example. They can come in and do some training for managers and for all employees. Um, more and more employers are going back and looking at their benefits package and how they can build in mental health supports. So that's something that um, you may want to consider. Promoting work-life balance. So we've all recently created these uh, right to disconnect policies. Um, now it's about living and breathing those types of policies that people are genuinely, um, their time away from work is honored and that that's important and that it's just kind of part of your culture, your mission and your values. Mental Health Awareness Month is a great opportunity as an employer to just participate and whether you um, promote it on communication boards or you have uh, emails or whatever that you're uh, bringing some awareness to it. So again, it's communicating to your workforce that um, you care about their health. Educate yourselves, um, just like we're doing today. This is a great example. Here are some resources, some you may already be using, but I wanted, these are, these are excellent uh, resources for mental health support. So I mentioned the Mental Health Commission of Canada. CMHA has a social enterprise called Mental Health Works. It's a fabulous, fabulous resource with lots of great um, uh, tools online. They even have like a return to work policy template, those types of things. Canada Life, their workplace strategies for mental health are excellent, guarding minds at work. CAMH, they have mental health modules that they're online. They're quite short and um, I've done them like with my team and they're on different mental health, mental illnesses, as well as addiction. 
um, WSPS, they'll do workshops for you and your team at quite reasonable rates. And then the Job Accommodation Network, Ask Jan, that's a great website to just go on yourself and get ideas about accommodations. So you can type in what the challenge is that an employee might be having, and it'll give you all kinds of resources and ideas about how you might accommodate that person so they can be successful and not, not have to leave the work platform. So I've covered a lot, um, and I think we'll probably open it up to the Q&A now, Jessica. I'm gonna stop sharing. Yes, thank you so much, Bev. That was, that was incredible, and I appreciate so much, like so many tangible solutions. Um, that's always something that I think people are looking for when they come to sessions like this. And that is um, what we're gonna do now. So if there's any questions that anybody has, or just points of discussion or something, that you want to get Bev's advice on or something like that. Um, I have a few questions of my own, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll see if the audience has any first that they want to bring up. Okay, while, um, while people think about that, I'm wondering, Bev, um, like where you see the biggest gap in workplace mental health, like what's missing and what's your, um, like one of your, like if you'd love to see it in an ideal world, your suggested solution. Yeah, the biggest gap is, and it's not just in workplaces, but it's impacting workplaces, is the lack of access to um, mental health supports. So, um, you know, there's huge wait lists. In a, in a perfect world, it would be fabulous if employers could have a mental health counselor on site, you know, those types of supports. There's goodwills in the states that have uh, nurses, they have psychotherapists uh, right on site, kind of integrated into the workplace. And to me, that would be, you know, in a perfect world. But that's our reality today. We just, we don't have access, um, full access that people to what they need. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking that especially with like um, those companies that have like 1500 workers or something, it would be amazing if they could have like a couple mental mm -hmm. health professionals on site. Um, another question I had was, I wonder how you would recommend to employers, um, like how to tell the difference basically, if an employee is having like if they're having like a poor work performance because of a mental health issue or if they're having a poor work performance just because like they're not passionate or they don't like their job or something like that and I wonder like um, usually what happens with that is like um, you know they get like a written warning or something like that so I wonder like what your advice would be on how to tell the difference between somebody who's um, having like maybe a, a lower work performance because of mental health issues and how they're having a lower work performance because it's just not a priority for them in their life. Mm -hmm. So again, the perception tends to be when you see that type of behavior in the workplace, we often assume it's lack of motivation, it's behavior. We don't necessarily immediately kind of think about, oh, something else could be going on here. So I think first and foremost, don't jump to make assumptions. Um, and then it comes down to that training on how to have the conversation. You really need to have a crucial conversation with that employee, explore what's going on. Not everybody's gonna be forthcoming. You have to, as an employer, we all have a duty to accommodate. So you have to have the conversations, ask the questions, explore, give that person an opportunity to share that they are struggling. If they don't, then you would have a policy around um, progressive discipline that you're going to need to follow. But you want to document that you've done your due diligence and you have explored, you know, do you require accommodation? That is a good question to be asking. And I think sometimes as employers, we're afraid to ask it because it means, oh God, like I could open up a, a can of worms and, and then what do I do kind of thing. But we do have a responsibility to ask that question. And if that person says, no, I don't, then you document that. And then if there's performance concerns, you move forward with your progressive discipline. 
Um, however, if you are asking those questions and you're asking it in the right way where it's not threatening and it's opening up a conversation, if people are disclosing that they are struggling, then you can start to accommodate and help them be successful. Um, work, we all know, is very meaningful to all of us. It gives us a purpose. And so if we can help that person be successful and continue to be productive in the workplace, that's a great success for them and for the employer. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions or discussion that they'd like to say? Um, I also want to mention that hopefully um, I can ask Bev for her presentation and her slide deck, and I will um, put this together just like in the last one into a little report so that um, you guys can watch a recording or just read through some of the resources so you have them linked. Um, I have a question in the chat, but while I read that, so I don't read it out loud for the first time and just sound crazy, I'll, um, Carla has raised her hand, so I'll let her go first. Great, thank you. Um, from what I've been hearing, and I've, I have taken the, uh, mental, uh, sorry, the mental health first aid course, yes. and that, I found that to be very excellent. So if you get an opportunity to take that with other coworkers, it's very useful, and I have, um, I have gone to those resources and have used it actually. So nice. it's been very helpful. Um, though what I hear a lot of in the conversation so far is the, the uh, employer's responsibility and using this as a um, restrictive manner in getting performance problems. And I don't always agree with that because uh, it's the way uh, some of the managers bring that on. Oh, do you have any any do you need any assistance like they should be bringing other uh, examples up it shouldn't be them as the individual who is going through some struggles they may not need, know what they need so i don't agree with jumping all the way to um you know performance issues and sending out letters i don't yeah. agree with that totally yeah and i i I don't know if I misspoke, but you're not going to immediately start, you know, sending letters and discipline. You would have a progressive, but if, if you have approached the conversation and the person just simply is not disclosing or they're saying clearly, I don't, I don't, I'm fine kind of thing. As an employer, your hands are kind of tied. Um, you do have a business to run. I'm not saying that you're immediately jumping into that, but you are going to have to at some point consider that if nothing's changing. Um, not everybody oh, yeah. is mm -hmm. ready to accept the help, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if there's a union in the, uh, yeah. in the office, they're very helpful. And oh, yeah. uh, sometimes um, there's a conflict between the manager and that individual that if, you know, they're asking, do you have any needs? What do you, what would you like me to do? I mean, I've seen it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So they need another avenue to speak yeah. to so that somebody else can advocate on their behalf. That's a great, great point, Carla. And I'm glad you brought it up because, um, you know, we've got policies around, um, bringing forward concerns. So you probably have within your harassment policy, for example, if an employee isn't comfortable talking to their manager, yes, they absolutely really do need to know who else they can speak to. And it might be a union rep, it might be an assistant manager, it might be another like a supervisor, but I think that's a great point. It's important that employees know who their avenues are um, because you're right, uh, depending on the relationship with their manager, it might just not be a safe space for them. Thank you for that. Um, I have, I have a couple questions in the chat. Um, I have one quick one and then I'll go to you, Lori. Um, it's, can, can U.S. employees attend the course Mental Health First Aid that's offered in Canada? And is there a link to CAMH? I can provide the link to yeah. CAMH. Um, but what about that, Bev? Can U.S. employees attend the course Mental Health First Aid that's offered in yeah. Canada? Yeah, it's online now, so I would think that they can. So we can actually, we can send the link as well, Jessica, for the mental health first aid training. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. And um, I'll go to you, Lori. I'm just kind of following up to what Carla had said. So I've been finding that my clients, sorry, I'm with LEADS, so yes. supportive employment. Um, and I've been finding that my clients with lived mental health experience are most successful in the workplace from interview right through to, to working 
when we've had a really good conversation about when they disclose and how they disclose, what their lived mental health is. And the people who are disclosing, you know, during, if someone's asking a question in an interview about, you know, what hours are you looking for and what, you know, do you need accommodations? And if they're coming out and saying, you know what, I have a medication routine that I'm optimally functional from 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon. If you want to get the best out of me, that's it. You know, however they phrase it, the more honest they are at the start, the more accommodating the employers have been. And I'm talking about employers that do not necessarily like goodwill hire from a, from a, a typical vulnerable population. Yeah. And um, before this workshop, I was just going on to my stats and my clients with lived mental health experience, those that are more than 80% retention in their jobs for more than six months have disclosed early. Um, and, and so it kind of speaks to itself. And the other thing that I'm finding with employers is that if they've disclosed early, you know, for example, I have a young fellow who they started at a position of five hours a day, four days a week. And he was doing three days and then he was either calling in or calling me. There was some kind of red flag by that fourth day. So he and I and the employer sat down and they knocked him down to three days. And he was still struggling a little bit, but he was then able to talk to her and say, you know what, this is what I'm struggling with. And they came up with, if he woke up in the morning and his anxiety was getting the better of him, he would call her or he would call me. And one of us could talk him through being able to go into work. But it was very early on in the process for most of these people. Excellent. Yeah, it's all about the stigma, you know, it does still exist, but the more we can socialize this, you know, many, many people are struggling with anxiety and depression. I mean, whether it's formally diagnosed or not. So there needs to be more sensitivity is a good thing. Um, yeah. Thanks, Lori. Bev, I have another question in the chat. It says, do you have any suggestions to encourage staff to feel comfortable sharing their mental health concerns or mm -hmm. needs for accommodation due to mental health? Due to the stigma that's unfortunately still associated with mental illness, staff may not disclose these concerns. Yeah, and you know, it's a very personal uh, situation. Every, every employee is gonna have their own story. And it would be unfair for me to say, you know, well, you should tell it, right? Um, but I do think it goes back to the culture. So the employer, the, the, the culture, if the culture can be one of, you know, support and acceptance and um, people will feel more safe to disclose. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of bad experiences when people have disclosed. So I think that there's, you know, they have um, past experience that's probably, um, creating some hesitancy and the stigma does still exist. But I think it's just, um, if you're a service provider that's supporting a client, you'd really, really wanna have a good sense of that employer that you're encouraging that person to disclose to. I agree with Lori that, you know, if you disclose early on and you're very open about, and you have ideas about what you would need to be successful, I think that, that, that that's welcome by most employers. You're making their job easier, right? Um, but if you don't know that employer, you might want to tread lightly. Um, and as a, lo a local business, again, it just comes back to your culture. The more you can do to really um, bring your values to light and really instill that culture of acceptance, um, people will be more prone to, to disclose. And then if they do disclose, you really need to make sure then that you're adhering to your policies and, you know, accommodating that person so they can be productive. On that note, Bev, I have a question that kind of leads into that. Um, if you have a client who's in an employment position in a, what the employer would claim to be a non-bully culture, um, where, but the managers um, and the and the people, the employers are bullies and they do bully the employee. How would you recommend somebody help a client deal with that? <laughs> That's a tough one. So right there, I mean, the, the culture is a concern and, you know, tough to work in an environment like that. 
and and to feel good about the work you do and go home at the end of the day feeling good about yourself if you're being bullied right and if that's the culture if it's not just one person but it's actually a, a team or the management level um that's a tough one and honestly um you might want to be thinking about a more supportive employer um having said that though uh i would I would be, you know, going through the proper channels, um, you know, maybe you engage human resources, have a conversation um, and definitely uh, be the advocate for that client. I mean, there's going to be potentially repercussions if that's the culture, right? That's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Lori, is your, yes, you put your, sorry, I didn't know. Just, to follow, just to follow up to that, I have a small business uh, employer that she's fabulous for accommodations and interestingly enough the person that trains and kind of manages all of the frontline staff lives with anxiety herself but she can be a little abrupt and, and appear to be not too supportive to the people who are struggling with same so hmm. this employer actually just asked me if i had anything that i could share with her that she could do as a general um in-service training and hoping that this supervisor would catch on to the fact that this is what's needed in the workplace because she feels like she's kind of against the wall. She loves this person. Um, she used to work for her as a frontline worker and she's kind of gone up the ranks, but she's had people leave and she's starting to figure out that it's because of this person. Yeah. Right. So while she looks to replace this person, she's trying to change the culture by doing a little bit of education. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's great that it's great because the education, the awareness for, you know, the team is fabulous. She needs to have a crucial conversation directly with that person, though, because, again, this person might not have any self-awareness and you can't change your behavior if, if you're not aware of it. Our next session is here on the screen. It is um, on July 27th. It's addressing Ukrainian needs in the labor market. Um, it's going to be um, with Petruja Hontar from the St. Thomas Algin um, Local Immigration Partnership. I consider her like an expert in this field and um, she has her own passions for it, which is incredible. And um, she's picked out in tandem with the um, Ukrainian Association in London what the three most prominent needs are right now for Ukrainian people in our, in our region at least. And so um, she's going to be talking about that and how we can help to accommodate them, what like employers and service providers can do, um, as well as, which I didn't know, like um, the difference between like how they're coming into our region and stuff like that and what that means. So that session will be on the 27th. I'm going to put, I'm going to put it in the chat. And I also see that there's lots of things coming in in the chat. So I'm going to check that in case there's more questions. Okay, everybody's just saying thank you. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Bev. The link is in the chat for the next one. The recording will be up and I'll make sure I send everybody the report with all the information that was shared today. So thank you everybody for being here. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Thank Bev. you, Jessica. Thank you.